Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for being with us today. Uh, uh, this is a, a unique time for all of us. Uh, something which I'm sure none of us have understood or know what's happening. Uh, we actually living, if I may use the word, day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the way I call this is actually, in a way, a world war because every nation in the world is trying to save its people and that's what we're basically trying to do. So we are fighting this whole thing. But uh, let's start and to begin with, I would like to show you a, a small film. So if you could mute your systems, let me start the film, please. DDP Crew. 30 years ago, we introduced you to the world of DDP. With a promise to put the power of knowledge in the hands of the people and to inspire and enable industries to excel. DDP Publications, setting the standards of excellence in industry-specific publications. Our iconic print brands provide insights and create an impact to inform, engage and enable better business. New and dynamic media. South African tourism we provide a digital foray to better your business and change the way you view the news. TDP representation, creating a buzz in the business. We are focused on destination marketing and PR. with innovative and market-leading products and services. TDP Exhibitions, taking India to the world. We created a platform for the industry to enter new markets and grow their business. TDP Tools, Providing cutting-edge and valuable content-driven products. GDP Awards. The first regional awards that recognize excellence, inspire business and motivate the industry. Awards are a way to say thank you to the industry. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'd like to share some uh, facts with all, with all our listeners today. Uh, let me put it this way, that Middle East has always been a very interesting and a unique market in more than one way. Uh, before this whole uh, pandemic started, I would like to mention that UNWTO uh, actually had said that the Middle East uh, outbound numbers were pegged at 46 million this year. They were supposed to reach that. And, and they will reach 61 million by 2030. Well, things are now, now a little very different. Interestingly, uh, the per trip expenditure for the Middle East traveler is among the highest in the world. We know they really spend a lot of money. That's what they're looking at. Uh, and the recently HVS report, which actually came out, says that the purpose of travel will vary after the post-COVID area. That's what they basically mentioned. So I'm going to share some facts with you. Their findings suggest that 39% of the travel will be family gatherings and, re and reunions. 39% will be family travel, gatherings and reunion. 29% will be holidays and leisure travel. While business-related travel will stand at only 31%. The medical travel will decline to about 1%. I don't think people are going to wait for medical treatment. And out of this, 66 travelers will 66% of the travelers will favor an international branded hotel mainly due to the safety measures and guidelines which will be in place. Having said this, there's one more point I'd like to add on this. The younger millenniums make up 25, will make up 25% of the MENA region's population, which is going to really be traveling now. 
but this is what is been predicted the question now is what happens now where do we go to what is the way forward for this purpose particular reason we have got some experts among us who are going to tell us their views and these panel of experts let me tell you have a vast experience some of them have really know the industry very well and i will now introduce all all of them to you that's what i will do to start i will start with uh, with the lady right there which you can all see it is is priya uh, naskaya she is the deputy minister for marketing at the ministry of tourism and creative economy for the republic of indonesia thank you naskaya has been in civil service for 29 years as the minister of tourism and creative economy in february 2020 she was officially appointed as the deputy minister for marketing and has been responsible to promote the country across the world she specializes and that's something which is very important she specializes in digital marketing tourism hub program and joint promotion program in the international forum ms nataya held the position of the vice president for un of general assembly from east asia pacific yeah and in 2019 she was also she also represented the indonesia she also represented indonesia in the g20 tourism ministers meet welcome madam nice to have you so much and thank you for having me the next person i'm going to i'm going to introduce you is the young man which you see in your black t-shirt over there uh, that is muzammil and hosein he is the executive vice president of the sina group of consumer travel business unit he spearheads the growth and development of al mukhtar saudi arabia's own channel travel brand and tajawar one of uae's top ota an international recognized management consultant and operational executive he leverages his vast experience scaling and optimizing operations to enable sustainable growth and cater to the nuna regions evolving travel needs to seamless technology development lots of technology that's what i look for i understand that to you welcome welcome to us thank you very much thank going you going on going on you're going to see this lonely gentleman who's right there is is paul will he is the executive vice president of commerce and commercial of cross regions and resorts all his great curated a distinguished career in sales and marketing leader for over 19 years is experience in out of his experience in this hospitality sector while actively identifying and influencing strategic growth market he has successfully led teams in africa europe australia new zealand and asia his specialities are sales strategy market analysis revenue management change management lead generation and channel management paul is there something which is left i don't know in 2020 18 uh, paul joined the team of cross hotel and resort and is currently overseeing sales revenue distribution e-commerce and communications of the group paul welcome welcome to us It's pleasure to have you uh, you need to switch on all of you need to switch on your mic uh, because that's something we like to uh, sure okay now moving ahead what i what i would like to do is that we i would like all of you to uh, to give your opening statement that's something which we would like to do and the best way to uh, begin would be with the deputy minister over to you let's hear your initial thoughts of what is the situation and what does it portray to the middle east over to you thank you thank you moderator it is a great pleasure for me to be here uh, to meet you all the round table with travel talk Okay um Middle East for Indonesia it's a very important market because the length of stay of them and the spending is above the average tourists coming to Indonesia and 60% out of the Middle East arrivals coming from Saudi Arabia and also Dubai especially is the hub of tourists coming to Indonesia from other part of the world so i think uh, dubai is very important for us and middle east for sure uh, now at the moment we are facing the very challenging situation the government is really uh, put so much effort to combat the covid pandemic that uh, today it seems that jakarta is the most pandemic uh, area but now is slight Slightly uh, going down the numbers since uh, government really push into the program that we call um, 
large scale uh, social distancing so people cannot go out to uh, Jakarta. But the good thing is I would like to share with you it's Bali because Bali is the main capital of tourism of Indonesia, but Bali is not the main of pandemic. If you look at the statistical perspective, the numbers of recovered in Bali is uh, increasing and then the death level is very minimum from the beginning of only, uh, I think, four people out of 300 uh, people are affected, which is on only 1%, the death rate, which is beyond, below, below the average of death rate in, in the country. Um, why Bali uh, can manage well? Because this is uh, the role of the village or desa adat we call, combining with the local wisdom and then take all participants in any level so they can manage uh, the COVID is, uh, is, is really great. And even Bali becomes the role model uh, for other, gov uh, other provinces. And then the, thanks to the governor and also the president really give appreciation to Balinese people and the governor. And in terms of the marketing strategy at the moment, uh, we, we have to segment that we have to address. First is for domestic. It's really the message is more on amplifying the message from the government about the healthy lifestyle and then stay at home. Uh, then for the international tourists, we manage the, our presence or reconnect with the, uh, the market with the role of our visit Tourism Indonesia FITO, we call Visit Indonesia Tourism Officer or Marketing Rep in the Market using the webinar thanks to the technology to reconnect uh, with the market and then to amplify what we are doing uh, as a government in coping with COVID to regain uh, the confidence. But basically, uh, I would like to share with you and then thanks to this event, we are really now doing what we call CHS uh, implementation, clean health and safety protocols in all touch point of the destination and also uh, in, in the attraction. Uh, this is in line with the all touch point of the traveler's journey. This is what we are doing to regain their confidence. And later, and we, the condition already recovered, we do like appealing program. This is like uh, we have to continue our cooperation with the players like online travel agent, wholesalers, and airlines. And then we will do mega fund trip, we're inviting the medias and also QOL uh, to uh, make sure that uh, this is the destination get ready. So in terms of desti destination, since Indonesia is so huge, we have to make a priority. The minister has already decided uh, while we are preparing the whole country for sure, but we have to make priority. First is Bali first. Uh, we have to make sure that destination gets ready. We don't want to create new waves anyway. And then the second destination is at Jogja uh, in Java, which is the domestic uh, tourist favorite destination. And then Batam Bintan, which is destination mostly foreigner coming via Singapore. I think uh, that is my opening remarks that I could share with you. Thanks. Sorry, I can listen. Uh, you are mute. Sorry. I think you are on mute. Uh, my error, my mistake. Sorry, you're right. Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Ms. Shaya. That was really, really uh, uh, wonderful to hear from you. And uh, now moving on, I'm thank going you. to move on to uh, uh, Muzamil. Uh, I really would like to know. Uh, what's your opening remarks, keeping in mind from an OTA point of view? How does this thing work out and what's your opinion on that? Please. Sure. Thank you very much. I think, I think um, obviously, we're in difficult times. Uh, business is at a standstill uh, in the month, you know, and maybe even negative for many companies given the refunds are more than the bookings. Um, what we've done is kind of a, a, a multi, multi prong strategy. Uh, first is we've decided to identify where in our core technology and platform we want to make investments. Um, as, a group, uh, as, a, as a business unit, we had been growing so fast, um, you know, thankfully with the support of our, of our customers and our partners, we never had a time to actually take a chance to sit back and, and kind of clean up stuff. Obviously, there's a lot more focus on amendments, cancellations, these types of things. And we're doing our best to prepare for the new normal. So by, by that, we're investing in our product and our technology. 
to for the new normal. Uh, in addition, to provide customer information, uh, you know, as, as the minister said, deputy minister said earlier about health and safety standards. So we want to be able to provide good information, good content, and to make the customer comfortable about travel when travel returns again. That's been a big focus for us. The second thing uh, that we're doing is uh, is, is around uh, understanding the customer's needs and understanding what the customer wants. So we're doing a lot of surveys with our customers, especially in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and UAE, around what they're looking for. Obviously, uh, the as we said earlier, the first type of market is going to be the domestic market, uh, regional market. Um, we're understanding what preferences the customer has, what type of information they want to know, what type of um, destinations they want, will, it, will their travel patterns different, uh, what will make them comfortable. Uh, for example, we just completed a survey, and one of the more, one of the things that we found out is a lot of people want uh, to know if there's uh, medical safety certificates required or quarantines required. People won't travel to destinations unless they know about this information. So our job as a travel agency, uh, both online and in our retail store, is to provide this information. So we're trying to get the best holistic perspective. And the third part is around training our people. Uh, as Abu Safra, we have over 250 uh, travel advisors in Saudi Arabia, uh, and we need to educate them around uh, about travel safety precautions, what there is to do in destinations. We're doing a, a bunch of uh, training sessions with with other tourism boards, with the local Saudi authority, to train our people and make sure that they're ready for educating customers about travel. So that, that's kind of what our focus is. Uh, again, the technology, the content, and the training of our people. Fair enough, uh, Muzamil, that, that's, that's perfect. And uh, that's the way I agree. And safety point, I'll come to a little later with you because that's something which is extraordinary. Uh, going on and moving on to Paul. Uh, Paul, we'd like to hear uh, your opening remarks, but keeping in mind that you're the most important part in this whole thing. Because if you don't have a hotel, I can't go to Bali. And you, and, and he's not, Muslim is not going to take me there. So uh, your starting comments, please, Paul. Uh, sorry, Paul, your uh, mic is. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I look off to commercial for the group. So I'll talk more on the commercial side of things. And again, I talk with, uh, I'm, I'm pragmatic in the outlook. I mean, we've had to learn to live with coronavirus. The facts of the matter is now we just need to learn to work with coronavirus. So the world must go on. We're seeing a lot of green shoots. We're seeing a lot of um, easing in laws. So we're starting to see our occupancies grow. In the last two weeks, we've opened three hotels in and, in and out Bangkok, and we've seen occupancies go up to 100% and 90% midweek, because we're seeing just total changes in how people travel. For instance, people have, don't have to work from the office anymore. So we're starting to see midweek, people are staying the Sunday and Monday and staying at the hotel and working from the hotels. So these are the opportunities that we're seeing. We're also seeing our, our tier two and tier three cities grow because people aren't necessarily focusing right now on the heavy, heavy capital areas. So we're seeing a lot of other boutique areas open where we have key hotels as well. In terms of the Middle East, when I looked at STR, I mean, the Middle East has, has been quite resilient. You guys only closed 36% of your hotels, where the rest of the world closed up to 70, 80% of their hotels. So that was the positive sign. When we looked at your absolute occupancy for the Middle East, especially Qatar and Saudi, they were at 30%, ranging up to 49%. So again, you know, we're seeing a lot of positive moves coming out of that region. For us, it's pretty straightforward why this market is really important. Spend per check. They spend when they come to the hotels. I'll be honest, they are second highest spenders after the French. You know, their length of stay, you can be very clear on how you market to the Middle East because we're only six hours away. You know, Bangkok is the most visited city in the world. We have 39 million visitors um, alone. Um, so we see people come for two or three days and we see people come for two to three weeks. And the Middle Eastern market travel year round. And we see that as well because we also have some great products in Bali. And the other one is families. You know, people want families in their resorts. We target family travel. So spend per check, length of stay, they travel year round and they normally travel in families. So that's perfect for us. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That, that, that's, uh, that's very 
heartening to know. And this is good that you got your three hotels operation at this time. That's wonderful. That's really good news. I hope this this whole thing continues uh, with every one of us. Uh, now, moving on, I'm going to come back to you with my questions now. I have certain questions to ask you. And uh, uh, Nishaya, I'm going to come to you first. I really sure. need to. I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, that, that, that very two specific questions. Do you think that there is going to be life with COVID? Or are you going to look for tourism after COVID? That's that's my first part of the question because that's something which we all uh, because we don't know about the cure when is going to the vaccine is going to come in is is all is all up in the air so that's one thing which we really like to look at and second thing which is which is now come as I think that's going to become a part of our life which is going to be social distancing which we talk about and uh, uh, Paul I'll come to you later because in a hotel that becomes very important uh, what are the best practices you would be looking at in your destination, especially in Bali? I mean, of course, you have beaches and stuff like that, but still, uh, how are you going to be managing social distancing there and, and at the same time, life with or without COVID? Okay, thank you. Oh, it's a very challenging question anyway. Uh, first, uh, now the president is having checking the malls. Yeah? This is a good sign, I think. Uh, if uh, For sure, I, I would say that... Uh, the people first, uh, people safety must put in place first, right? But we don't know until when. So for domestic, for, for sure, we will rebound domestic first, but in really very tight, uh, the SOP of the health uh, procedure, very tight. Uh, the government now is, uh, especially for me, for example, as a government official, we have to go back to work. Uh, next week, if there is not extended, if it's planned for one month, then becomes two months. Uh, the the president gave a signs like we have to live with COVID, so we have to walk in between COVID. That's why uh, there is rules like as as in, I think happens in any countries, wearing masks becomes a normal, physical distancing for sure, and uh, so we are managing that part. In the malls, uh, the president will check are they ready or not. So now, actually, we are in the process of uh, preparing for sure first. So it it goes it gives signs that we will live together must be spread in between, uh, and then of course the campaign of healthy lifestyle. This is I think the key. What we are waiting for the curative uh, medicine uh, for COVID. For tourists, uh, we don't. Uh, there is we don't have. Uh, uh, sign in for this, but we are preparing in Bali first. Preparing again, but we don't know yet. We're gonna open because it must be to both sides. The origin country gives permission, also the destination gets ready. We don't want to ruin the image of destination. We don't want to invite second wave for the community, the destination, also for the tourists. But the in terms of the pilot project, we make Bali for sure. And very rigid for domestic. I'm supposed to fly to Bali, but I will rearrange because they need like PCR testing. It's not rapid. It's not enough. So this is a kind what we are doing. Really uh, rigid with the protocol. And in Bali itself, we will um, how do you say choose the piloting only in Nusa Dua. It's a resort exclusive area. So if something happens, it's easier to contain. This is the step that we're going to do. First, I would like to repeat first is domestic first. With uh, 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 living with COVID, but very, very rigid uh, application of the SOP, implementation of the SOP. Uh, then for destination Bali, not the whole Bali, specific will piloting first. We need to talk, uh, we're going to have also a discussion with the governor about the time. So we haven't decided yet when. But we are preparing. When it comes the time, then we are, we get ready. So I think this is uh, the basic that we have to prepare. Very, very, uh, how do you say? Very, um, very rigid. So we don't want really just for the sake of economy. No, we have to put the safety of the first in the first place. Okay, I want to ask you this question before. You see, you mentioned Bali as your uh, uh, tourism capital hub. I would really say that's what you mentioned. Now. When do you think Bali would really, because you haven't given us a date, but you think when would Bali be ready to receive uh, tourists? Uh, 
if it opens up, it could be next month, would it be or July, would it be August? Some some kind of I'm not I, holding you from that number, but sure. some idea. Uh, I'll tell you when I cross the bridge. Right. Okay. I, I I give you that opportunity to leave that all that. Okay. Uh, moving on. Now, I want to ask you the same thing, uh, Muzamil. Uh, you mentioned in yourself that your uh, your biggest challenge at the moment is safety with the various tourism destinations, which you're trying to look at. That's a part of what you people are doing. So keeping in mind, so my question to you is, is there a life with COVID or you are trying to look at life without COVID? That's one part. And then what are the things which you see and check when you tell a client to travel to a particular destination from a safety point of view. Sure. Well, um, I think uh, uh, I think that there has to be life with COVID for travel. If, if there isn't, I don't think the industry would survive. Uh, let's let's be realistic. Uh, it'd be very difficult for airlines, hotels, travel agents, tourism, uh, the entire tourism industry to survive uh, for you know 12, 18, 24 months without any any kind of tourism. So. Uh, our, our job as travel agents is to connect uh, connect and educate people with what, what's possible in the new normal. Uh, so what, we, what we're looking at is, uh, let's say there's qualitative uh, metrics and quantitative metrics. So quantitatively, you know, are there cases uh, in that destination? Are there, are there issues? What are the safety protocols? What are the curfew hours, et cetera? What, what activities are open? What restrictions there are? That's a very... The standard information, uh, but more more than that, it's about what kind of experience will a person have when they go to that the destination. You know, for example, they may be coming to Dubai, and typically they would go to the Dubai Mall and watch the fountain show, and they would go to uh, the beach, and then they would uh, they would uh, go to Dubai parks. But if Dubai parks is closed, the beach is closed, and the mall is only open for four hours, and they cannot take their kids. We wouldn't, it wouldn't be right for us to advise them to take their kids on a family vacation to Dubai unless they knew this information. So our job is to educate them so they know what they're, what's happening. Obviously, the challenge will be, you may come to me in our store or online today, but in three weeks, the change, there might be a change. So it's a balance, uh, providing information of what's relevant. Um, we, we want them to know what's possible. We want them to do the right resources. It, it's really about helping them understand what experience they'll have in the destination so they can make that decision. And then secondly, what's the experience in the journey? So they need to be at the airport three hours early, not an hour early. They, need to, uh, they may need to be required to have a uh, test 48 hours before. They may be required to, um, to bring their own gloves and mask. They may be required all this information about the, the pre-trip, during trip, post-trip, is what's important for us to educate our customers. Uh, I think that's the biggest, biggest responsibility and role that we have. It's not to falsely generate demand for travel by giving incorrect information. It's actually to provide accurate information to help people make decisions. But I want to ask you one more question on that. Do you also uh, evaluate destinations and places for your customers? Um, but pre-COVID, our job would also be then definitely work with um, tourism boards, hotels, and the typical industry model where we, we send our experts to understand the experience, give advice. We are not health and safety experts, right? So we, our job is to give information about that. We are not going to say this place is safe or not safe. That's not something that we're, we're the right people for. Uh, our job is, again, to educate and share the information um, we can we can provide uh, information about what you can what things there are to do, but I don't I don't think it's responsibility of a travel agency, whether us or any other one, to say what's safe or not safe. Because that's, that's that's probably the government's responsibility. Oh, fair enough. I I do understand that. So you are not doctors, but uh, I call you travel doctors. So <laughs> I don't know I'm from that point of view. Okay, uh, coming coming to Paul. Uh, Paul, I really uh, want to add a little dimension to this. Uh, where you had as a hotelier, and you are seen all across the world. Everybody talks about COVID uh, and the social distancing, how you're going to get into a lift, how is the buffet going to be served and stuff like that. My question to you is a little different. What's, the, what's going to be the size of a hotel in future? Are they going to be just one or two floors? Are they going to be resorts? Or do you have to travel in a lift? Will there be no room service? How do you, how do you see uh, what's it going to be like? 
look into your crystal ball and tell us. Yeah. I guess coming back to what I originally said, you know, we've learned to live with coronavirus. And when this all happened, we couldn't believe that we had to stay indoors. We couldn't believe that we couldn't do this. We couldn't believe that we couldn't do that. And eventually, it became the norm. That's exactly what's happening with work. In terms of, you know, when you initially set out the spacing on the tables, originally the, the clients were quite disgruntled, you know, because they're not used to it. But within a few days, it just became the norm. You know, so I wouldn't say that um, hotels are drastically going to change in terms of size. Okay. You know, we got to, we can't underestimate human beings. They're smart. You know? People don't want to get sick. Um, people understand the rules. People follow the rules. I genuinely think hotels are just going to be a lot safer and cleaner environments. Not that they weren't before, but, you know, you just got to up your cleaning. You know, your menus. Again, we move away from menus. All your menus will be on QR code. So, again, that's sustainability. Plus, there's no handling of the menus. That's a good thing. So as I always say, what is the new norm? The new norm is the current norm that's happening at that point. Um, I don't think it's it's going to drastically change. Just things are going to become faster and more efficient. Check-in. It's not going to be 10 different people stamping and clipping and checking in. You know, So everything that we're doing now is quite exciting because you talk about innovation. Big companies used to have big R&D and innovation budgets. Those are all white and everyone's focusing on the top line. Over this period, not saying that we haven't been busy, we've been able to sit back and actually innovate and come up with some great ideas that I think will wow clients. Um, so back to your question, mate, I don't think you'll see drastic change. We've just got to trust in the system and trust in human beings. Okay. Uh, so so innovation is, is, is your benchmark. So that means that's going to keep on changing. Uh, and that's what's really will take us, take us on a different level. Okay, now since this comes to that, I'm coming back to uh, you, Madam, uh, Ms. Chaya. I really need to understand something because the Middle East is a very peculiar and a different market. And uh, uh, the changes which are happening over there. What do you think are going to be your uh, marketing changes which you're going to look at now post-COVID uh, or, the, or the way the things are at the moment? Are there going to be any strategic changes in your marketing activities? What are your marketing activities going to be in the Middle East? And a last of that question, which I want to ask all three of you, when do you expect your first wave of travelers from the Middle East coming to Indonesia? But first, let's talk about that. What are your changes in strategy? Uh, are you going to go in for social media? Are you going to go into a print? What are you going to be doing? That's a little level of thing. Uh, no, we can't, we can't hear you. You need to switch on your... Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. So thank you. I think, yes, we have to change our uh, marketing strategy. Uh, uh, the minister has reminded us to put more budget or effort on the digital. and It means social media anyway. Uh, that's the first in terms of platform. Uh, for sure, then the second one, uh, we have to more engagement with the local player since the, they are the one who really can um, influence the, the segment, the, the market. And then we have to empower our marketing representatives in the market since they are the ear and eyes of, uh, of, of us. Uh, that is in terms of the strategy. And we have to be more uh, segmented uh, because budget is limited. So we have to make sure to choose the platform and also the segmented. So I think we, again, this is about technology. We have to use more on machine learning uh, to to spend our budget uh, to bring in or to inviting uh, the customer. But anyway, regardless of uh, what is happening at the moment, we have to keep the market get inspiration. So for this purpose, uh, really digital makes uh, an important role for us. That is okay. our strategy at the moment. Fair enough. Then my point is because the Middle East market is, has two distinguish different kind of people. Oh, yeah. One is the Emiratis, mm -hmm. which I will call the Arabs yeah. over there, and one are, one are the expat, expats who are staying there. So yeah. which are you looking at? Which market are you think so will come first to you and when? Yeah. I think actually uh, uh, dividing customer is not, uh, is it a kind of how you managing, right? So we want to have both. We have we want to have both. Uh, of course, the message then will be different, and also the 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 platform. It depends which one is more influence 
still to that segment. Uh, for sure, Saudi also different. Uh, UAE, of course, uh, we want to tap the Emiratis and the expatriate. We will tap both uh, and then based on the our input of our embassies and also our marketing rep and also our partners. So basically, I would like to say that we want to tap all, uh, but what is the segment, the right segment, and what is the platform, uh, we, we listen to their uh, input, our partners. Okay, thank you. Uh, coming coming back to uh, Muzmil, technology, technology, technology. Everybody's talking about technology and digital and, and, and looking at social media. What do you think? So what, are you thinking of any changes when it comes to you in terms of uh, your strategy and planning for the future in the market, local market? And also uh, between the two uh, distinguished uh, the people who are going to be traveling, who do you think so will travel first and where to and when? Okay, I'll answer the second question first. I think it differs by market. So if you look at um, Kuwait, UAE, and Saudi, a different different structure. So let's take UAE as an example. UAE is uh, eighty percent uh, expat market. You know, about ten percent to three percent are local Emiratis, and then within the expat market, you have uh, you know probably fifty percent are subcontinent. Then you have the, the the Filipino community. You have the Arab expat, Egyptians, Levant, etc. In the UAE. Um, we believe uh, our, our initial indications and market not, uh, research is showing that the expats will travel first, but not for vacation. They will go home. So, oh, okay. uh, they will go home, visit their family, or many people unfortunately have, have lost their jobs in this region, and they will go home. That would be the first, uh, let's say, first part. But after that, a lot of expats who typically would, may have gone home will actually have nowhere to go. They won't be going on international vacations in the beginning. So there'll be a growth in staycation, a growth in vacations within the region, both for Emiratis and for expats. Uh, take a look at a market like Kuwait, you kind of have a mix of both. You have the Kuwaiti population, which are very, uh, they really, really enjoy travel. Uh, they're probably very excited to travel again. Um, then you have the expat people. So again, the expats would likely want to quickly get out and go home, visit their families. They've been away for you know many, many months, and, and uh, so they would want to go home. But the Kuwaitis, we are very confident in their um, you know their passion for travel, and we see them traveling. Obviously, the restriction of where they can travel is going to define where they go, but they are going to go somewhere. Yeah, and then in Saudi Arabia, we have a huge population of expats and also domestic. Again, the expat team remains the same. They will, uh, they will probably go and visit home. And a lot of them, once the uh, religious sites open up in Mecca and, and Medina, a huge growth in religious travel. For the Saudi, um, they, last night overnight, the, the Saudi government announced that the return of domestic flights, uh, effective on Sunday, which is it's great news for the industry to restart travel. And uh, that's going to be exciting to see the Saudis explore their own country more. Uh, for destinations they may have never looked at before in their own country and really, really get a sense to export Saudi Arabia. So we're really, really excited about, uh, you know, promoting domestic tourism in Saudi Arabia. And, and then again, expats will want to go home when they're allowed to and, and a strong growth in religious travel. This is, it's not a one size fits all, but we're having all different markets have different regions of travel. In terms of uh, what, what, what else we're doing, uh, for us, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's about providing uh, the right information for the customer to make a decision. Uh, Marketing-wise, we'll continue our strong digital marketing presence across social media and across, uh, across uh, influencers, etc. The most important job of marketing now is not going to be to blast discounts and, and generate that. It's about generating trust. So generating trust through... Uh, through partnerships with, with hotels, tourism boards, influencers, so people can really relate to traveling and, and they feel comfortable again. They'll see someone that they, they represent or someone that they relate to, that they look up to, uh, a celebrity or, or an influencer or, or just a normal person that is traveling and it's okay to travel and they're enjoying their experience. Our job is going to be to create trust again in travel. Okay, uh, but but tell me one thing. When do you think so? Because everybody's talking about 
uh, you heard uh, Madam Miss Cha say the same thing. Everybody looks at domestic tourism first and traveling over here. But when do you think so in the Middle East, the outbound will really take off? Or when do you think so? Uh, when will they be ready to travel? Uh, I think uh, two questions. So when will they be ready? I think probably many, some are even, even ready now. Uh, the, 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 the point is, um, when will when will we have the right um, capabilities to, to make sure that they can come back in safely? So people might want to go travel. If, let's say let's say Indonesia opens up, and it's great. And it's, Bali would be a great place for many of us would love to go. Uh, I know that I, I enjoy Bali as well. But if I can't come back, I'm not. It's not clear that I can come back. I might not go. So travel is going to be a lot of uh, requirement of clear understanding of the authority rules. Not only about safety and precautions, about coming back in. This is going to be important. So I, I really cannot uh, answer the question of when travel will open internationally until we have more clarity about what's required to come back home. People will not travel for seven, 12 days if they're not sure they can come back. They might, they won't even leave their country. The mistake is clear because they can come back home. This is the, ca the challenge that we need, and we need the support of everyone from the industry. You know, I believe, for example, New Zealand and Australia are testing out the kind of corridor where there's open travel again. That kind of information will help us uh, allow people to travel again. Okay, uh, so so you're not looking at some definite dates, but let's see what the other countries are doing, and then we'll we'll look at that. Point well taken. Uh, coming coming back to you, Paul. Uh, do you, because everybody's talking about the, the different kind of traveler that they want to be traveling, but your experience has been different. You've had some uh, hotels be open and you're still looking at 90 and 80% of your bookings, and that's domestic. Uh, a, when do you look at international uh, market to come back to you? And would there be any change in your point of view? Are you looking at some new mediums or some new media to look at, or are you going to follow the same thing that you have been doing? Yeah, uh, we have analysts looking at this day in and day out. A fact of the matter is domestic comes first. Um, you've seen domestic recovery in China. It's pretty much at the same levels. So everything we're doing right now is very focused on domestic. I think the next one after that will be regional. So regional for us is the likes of Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam. Um, and then after that, I think we'll start looking at international flights. Uh, I would I would envisage around November December, but again we've got to be pragmatic. And uh, further to what other people have said on this thread, in some destinations like Phuket or Bali, you've got ten to fifteen flights arriving a day from certain countries. When border borders open per se, you're not going to get ten to fifteen flights per day from that country. You might get two or three. So you know you've got to be very honed in on your digital transformation because that is accelerated at a massive point. But I think you asked, how, how are we going to get through that? What are we going to do? I am quite a simple guy. I say over analysis causes paralysis, but you just got to look at where the source is coming from. And that's where you point all of your marketing. That's where you do, you do your geofencing. That's where you target the experience for the stay. But it's going to go domestic, regional, international, but in terms of when we're going to see full travel back, I would say probably the middle of next year. Middle of next year. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's 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 a good twelve months, uh, twelve months or eighteen months from here. Uh, I understand that. But okay, then I want to add on something over here. Do you want to uh, now, as a hotelier, would you want to work with the travel trade? And get customers, or do you feel like reaching out to the to the consumers directly? And uh, what's 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 the way forward for you? I actually think, to be honest, the damage that um, COVID nineteen has caused, it's been across multiple segments. Um, it hasn't just hit hospitality. So what we're starting to see is your private and public sectors are probably more synergized than they've ever been, and they have to be. You know, you're looking at your, your tourism bureaus. You know, they're always there and they work with hotels and have synergies. But the synergies have to be even stronger. That goes with airlines as well. We, we all working with compressed wallets. We all working on people dropping their rates. So now when we package up and we work with airlines, we all kind of have to be working in a much tighter environment than we have for in order to survive. Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, 
So you want to work with the whole gamut of the industry and see how we can work with this. But that's what my basic question that brings me to uh, Ms. Chaya. That's that you are the, uh, you, like as, as a tourism board, you're the big daddy. So you need to work with everybody. You need to work with the airlines. You need to work with the hotels. Uh, you need to work with the travel agents, the guides, the attractions. I think the whole gamut of the industry. Now, my question to you basically is the same thing, I would really say, but I want to ask you is, uh, add two segments to it. One would, uh, one would be that the travel trade at the moment is, well, I'm not going to say the travel agents, but I think everybody is very hit, hit in a very big way. Uh, so what are your plans going forward? Are you going to uh, double your budgets or triple your budgets, work with them, encourage them? Uh, what, what as a tourism board are you looking at in the future? Okay, thank you. I think at the moment, uh we propose to put budget more on the destination first because uh, I think this is, uh, we have to recalibrate the destination towards the sustainable tourism. I think this is about time to deep dive, deep clean the destination. That is the first while in terms of marketing, we have to keep the, the effort, we have to keep informed to the market what we are doing in terms of keeping, uh, make it the destination healthier and safer. I think uh, that is uh, our doing. Uh, I would like to add, uh, as you mentioned, that we have to work with the industry, trade industries partner. But for Indonesia, we have to work together with the local government because we are from the central government. Is uh, we don't the how do you say the the uh, the ownership actually belongs to the local government. So this is why, as I mentioned to you in the beginning, when we are planning to open Bali first, so we have to talk with the governor of Bali with all stakeholders in the destination. So I think uh, uh, we propose that we have to put more budget on destination while marketing, we have to keep uh, inspiring. We have to work together for sure with the, the industry place in the market, but still, destination first we have to make it better and better condition which is fulfilled with the demand of the new normal but my sorry my added question to this is tomorrow if you're looking for business from the middle east yeah I'll love my example you want obviously you will also have to work with the travel industry over there it's just not getting your house in order it's also the travel agents over there and and you need to work with them uh, uh, you have a uh, uh, Muslim over here and if you want to in incentivize him. So what are your plans for that? What are you going okay. to be doing? Okay, for sure. Yes, we have, we call, yeah, I will, for sure we will do it. We will continue. We have done so far, but we will put more, of course, for that effort. We have to work together with the industry players in the market for sure. And then ideally we will do it uh, in all platform, conventional one, and also with the online travel agent and also the airlines for sure. Yeah, we will keep that one. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Bozumil, I'm coming to you. Uh, you have a tourism board. You have a deputy minister sitting right in front of you. If you were to look at working together, what would you expect from her? Uh, that's what I would like to ask you. And I'm adding a little bit on that is how do you expect the future bookings to look like? Okay. That's part two. But first is, uh, let's say, as you're based, based in the Middle East and you want to promote thing, what do you expect from her? So look, I think um, we, we've, we've actually worked with the Tourism Board of Indonesia before. Uh, we work with many tourism boards um, and it's a great relationship uh, because it's beneficial for both, right? Uh, it, it provides us with, uh, we, we sent our film crew to Indonesia, they filmed a number of sites and we're able to really educate our customers and do great videos. Uh, then we put, you know, marketing dollars together behind the campaign. I think now if you look at, and I won't speak for myself, I'll speak for, for all the industry, right? Obviously things have changed. Marketing budgets have changed. Uh, uncertainty is remains. Uh, until we get back to some sense of normal, the ability for any tourism or any travel agency to go and put, commit a number of funds to a destination um, will be limited. We need to be creative to work together with tourism board uh, to, to, allow, uh, to allow risk but also to understand the limitations of marketing dollars in the current environment. The marketing dollars that were there before, we've all seen the news from Booking, Expedia, et cetera, are significantly reduced. Uh, and especially now, uh, any marketing dollar that's gonna be spent without guaranteed return uh, is going to be limited. So how do you generate demand? How do you create awareness? How do you create interest, increase traffic for destination or awareness 
without uh, without by spend, without spending money by spending money, even though you're not sure if people are going to go there yet. This is going to be the challenge that we need to work with tourism boards uh, and other and their industry partners together to figure out: uh, is there some some kind of model that's more? Uh, I don't want to call it commission based, but you know, tier based or get some money to try something without spending, you know, the millions that were spent before. How do you do something to, to, to pilot different opportunities? That's going to be the challenge for us, um, to work together with tourism boards to drive a new way of marketing to given the new budget constraints as well. Okay. Uh, Paul, uh, coming to you. Uh, Musbil has been very diplomatic in his own way. Uh, but let me put it this way, Paul, you have, a, if I'm not wrong, you have a property in Bali, right? You have a hotel and uh, uh, two. Two, or two of them in, in Bali. Now, my point to you is you have, you have the principal, she's sitting right over here. What do you expect from her as the tourism board to help you in what way? What's the expectation to market in the Middle East, for example? I think it comes back to what I originally was talking about. It's not necessarily about anyone on this call. It's we just all have to think differently, totally and utterly different. You know, hotels, um, you know, we're not good at innovating all the time. Um, tourist boards are the same. You know, we get invited on the same showcases or the same road shows, you know, or the same trade shows. Is that the way forward? Do we change the way we market that? You know, are we focusing on new destinations or both hoteliers and tourist boards? Are we going to go back to just marketing the destinations that we know? We know that people want new destinations. We know that people want to move away from crowded areas. We know that people want a different experience in hotels. That's how we need to work with tourist sports in a, in a totally different way to probably what we've done before. Okay, fair enough. Now, actually, this brings this brings me to uh, my last question to all all three of you before I give you your uh, final moments to close up, uh, Madam. I want to start start with you. Uh, uh, this is something which is which I call uh, which is very different. I call this as which I need to ask you is a health visa uh, in want of another word. So I'm just trying to put that because it makes it easier for now. You're going to get the foreign tourists coming into your country and things like that kind. Now the point is what is going to be the new normal? Everybody says it's a new normal, but my point is the safety measures uh, at hotels or at, at attractions. Who's going to decide this? Will it vary from country to country? Uh, how does it really going to pan out? I really wanted to ask you, what is your part take on it and what are you doing? And will you have any restrictions of tourists coming into, let's say, Bali, for example? Yeah, I think there will be a uh, health declarations becomes important. Like at the moment, as I mentioned to you, uh, before last, I think last two weeks, I flew to Bali. It's enough with rapid tests. But now, from today, it's not enough. That is Bali. Jakarta also applies the same rules. So I think uh, health declarations has become a compulsory to any visitors. But would that be uh, across the globe for every other country the same? Are you going to have your uh, specials? Uh, I, I think I don't know yet because uh, it must be decided at a high level. Uh, because it really, really relates to other ministries also. But uh, I cannot say at the moment because the situation is so dynamic. But at least as a domestic, I can give you the example that is uh, working at the moment. Bali, I think, will be started from 28th of uh, May. And Jakarta, I think, started from today. So, if, for example, I fly to Bali, I have to get the health declaration. And then when I I was going, I'm going to fly back to Jakarta, I have to get a medical certification in Bali not as a result in Jakarta. Even I just for three days visit, whereas rapid test could uh, until seven days, for example, we have to do the same test in Bali because Jakarta also they have uh, the same uh, rules because uh, each destination they have to manage the curve of the pandemic. That's why, and I don't know until when, but that is what is happening at the moment for the domestic travelers, not the tourists, but this is mostly is for the official for business. For leisure, it's not allowed yet. I think even okay. for domestic, uh, if I may say, uh, even for domestic, there will be staging. First, I think staycation first, and then when people get confident, then there will be intercity, and then later uh, 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 beyond islands of our province so there is also staging in domestic 
Okay, uh, moving ahead, uh, Muzamil, health visas, are they going to be a reality in the future? That's what I presume. And how will it affect your business? Will that... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think the most important thing for us, uh, you know, we uh, as travel agents don't promote one destination. We are promoting many destinations, many locations, many cities. Uh, the more standards there are globally, the easier the easier the traveler's life will be. Therefore, the easier for our life will be to sell to to, to communicate that and sell to to facilitate travel. Uh, if every airport has its own regulation, if every country or every even province or city has no regulation, the amount of rules will be very, very difficult. Then I expect a lot more again, domestic or regional. But I think it will take time to get there. Uh, so there's going to be a few hiccups along the way. That's why I think everyone on this call uh, you know, has also said domestic first, because within domestic, at least you can control some sense of one government, one understanding, there's the airport authorities. Yes, there's provinces or states. Uh, but there's still some kind of coordination that can be done easily across the entire globe. If, uh, if a citizen of Saudi Arabia or resident flies to Bali and then wants to go to uh, Singapore and then wants to go to Dubai, if each three countries has a different rule, he cannot do one trip. He'd have to do too many rules. So we really have to understand the implications of the traveler and the travel experience. But I know that will take time. We're not, we're not expecting tomorrow or in the next week or two some rules to come out. Uh, as each country matures and gets more comfortable, we'll learn a lot and hopefully soon we'll have more of a global standard. I mean, that's, uh, that's the objective, uh, my perspective, uh, because if not, it will be very difficult to facilitate new, new real travel uh, on a sustainable, scalable matter. Until then, there's a vaccine. We're, we're trying to avoid that. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Paul, I'm asking you the same question, but in a different way. Uh, I'm looking at your experience. You're, you're, you've actually worked all over the world, uh, from Africa to Asia to Europe to everywhere. Uh, my question to you on the same thing, uh, like today, a visa is required for every country you travel to. Uh, do you think this health visa or this health certification will become uh, mandatory? And second point is, every country has its own right to develop them. But if there was a na if there's going to be a national or global body which is going to be creating this and saying, okay, this is what you should be following. With your experience, who do you think so should be doing that? Uh -huh. I, I'm, not, I'm not, not putting on the spot, but I'm trying to figure out who, 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 who should be really doing that. Okay. Um, in terms of the current situation, it's so dynamic at the moment. So I don't really know what the future is with, with, a, with a health password. But I do have the view that we are a lot cleaner. We are a lot germ-free. I've never washed my hands as much as I have. I know more about Corona now than what I originally read about it. I mean, we used to read that it was airborne, then it wasn't airborne, then it lived on the surface, then it didn't live on the surface. You know, we're far more educated um, in terms of how to kill the virus. And as I said, we've learned to live with it. Now we just need to learn how to work with it. From airlines through to hotels, we're just, at this stage, just putting in every barrier possible. To the passport stage, at some point, yes, I'm sure there will be some sort of clearance that will be needed, but everything comes down to a choice. Um, there was a time in to get into Zambia, you needed a yellow fever shot, and you needed a stamp on a certain book to get in. It was my choice to go to that country. You know, if there's certain outbreaks or the epidemics in certain areas, I think it's going to be a choice. Um, with regards to who makes that decision, I mean, the biggest governing body at the moment, um, love it or not, is uh, HWO. I mean, you need a big governing body that gives you the directive. You know, it's like anything. You, know, you might like your prime minister or you don't, but that's the governing body and that's what you've got to listen to. But where you see fantastic growth in numbers and great tourism is countries that don't put on too many restrictions. Because if you put on too many restrictions, people just don't travel. Okay. Uh so this all depends on what country and where you're going to be looking at. So, uh, well, I just want to say thank you to all of you. But before that, I want to give you guys a closing remark. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, Ms. Shai, I want to come to you first. But I want to ask you in your closing remarks to open up your crystal ball and gaze into it and tell us what do you think so is going to be the future of travel and travel bookings? What do you think so will, according to you, uh, even as a guess estimate, what is going to be like? 
and then your closing remarks. Oh, thanks. I think uh, the window booking becomes shorter, and then there will be uh, the demand will be lower, but the supply will be higher. So the competition will be very tight. That is the future. Okay. Then my closing remarks. Uh, I would like to say that we are preparing the cleaner, healthier, and safer destination to welcoming you back to Indonesia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I'm going to go back to Paul now. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you the last of this thing. Uh, Paul, again, look into your crystal ball and say. Uh, what is going to be the future like and your closing remarks? What do you think is going to be from a hotel perspective? Can you hear me now? So people want to travel, people need to travel, and, in, and it's in a lot of people's DNA, you know, wanting to experience new things. So Asia in itself is resilient. It's also more affordable than most places to travel. So I truly believe Asia will bounce back very fast. In terms of your booking patterns, yes, it'll be a lot shorter. And in terms of hotels, what we need to do is you're just going to get a better experience. The hotel is going to be cleaner, more efficient. You know, the food is probably going to be sourced locally at a much better level, cooked a lot healthier. You know, you're probably going to see a bigger movement in uh, health and fitness because people have actually realized the importance of movement so i just generally think everything is going to improve because it has to okay paul thank you uh Mudamil, i'm coming to you as the last word now you heard both of them and they said uh shorter thing but the experience is going to be good cleaner air, a better environment i think a lot of those things are happening then my question to you is, why should they be shorter shorter breaks? They should be longer breaks in a way. But uh, having said that, uh, I really need to understand from the Middle East, what do you see in your crystal ball? Uh, what is the way forward in the next year or two? Yeah, I mean, uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm really excited to hear, uh, you know, from our colleagues here about the new experience of travel. So health, we know that our customers are going to want health and safety standards. We know that they're going to want uh, 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 as safe as possible experience. And the more that the hotels, the airlines, and the countries and the tourism boards are able to, to do that, they'll really, really um, make people comfortable and build trust again in travel. So I think Middle East, Middle East, uh, the, the people in the Middle East are always, uh, you know, love to travel. As we know, uh, they, they like to travel in large groups. They have more than, you know, four to six trips a year, uh, high disposable income to travel. Uh, I spend on travel. I don't think that will change. I think it will just take time to build that trust back. And, and our job is to work with you know the industry to educate people about this, uh, to share about that, and to there will be a few false starts. I do believe there will be some mistakes along the way. Hopefully, uh, these are mistakes that that's why we do these pilots. That's why we, as as our colleague here mentioned about Indonesia piloting a certain part of the country, uh, part of Bali. So we have. We have uh, false starts, we might have some mistakes, but that's why we have to be very, very careful uh, in, in making sure the customer knows where we are in the journey of, of making this for them. Uh, the, first, uh, the first time a hotel opens, their safety standards, while they might be great, much better than they were before, if you go back to hotel in two months, maybe it'll be even much better. If you notice, for example, Emirates Airlines, when they started these repatriation flights, the service was one way, but now they've improved already. So there'll be a continuous improvement in the industry, and that's innovation that we talked about. This innovation will continue to bring and generate demand. So in summary, I think the Middle Eastern traveler uh, is going to continue to travel. We have to build their trust. They will probably stay home closer first. But the good thing about the Middle East is they can get to pretty much anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world within 36 hours. You can get to places like Singapore, Far East within six hours. You can get to places like, um, uh, Africa, you can get places to like to Egypt, to, to parts of Eastern Europe, Southern Europe. So we can explore a lot of the world still within these short distances once, once we build that trust map. All right, uh, Mazamel, thank you so much. And uh, before I thank my panelists, all of three of you, I just want to say I could have agreed more with you. This was quite enlightening to understand. And I think the whole of Middle East is actually looking forward to hearing, hearing your point of view, but that's what's going to 
uh, drive the future uh, business and the way forward because everybody is going to be uh, is going to hear your point of view and then decide the way forward. Uh, lastly, as, as I say, uh, my personal point of view, I think this is like uh, this is just a stop. Uh, it's a train which is going. It's just stopped at a station, and we're going to start again. Uh, so that's the way I, I look at this this crisis as such. But I really want to say thank thank you all of you. Uh, thank you, madam. It was such a pleasure. Uh, oh, thank you, Paul, God. and thank a Muslim. Thanks a lot, all of you. Wonderful, and we will keep in touch. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.